you can see just by looking at this painting it is about hard work it is about the exploitation it is about the possibility of a light in the future the talk today is about these things and we're going to go through it in a very strange way we're going to start by looking at a goat what does a goat have to do with the art crisis. I hope that by going through the different images I will be able to explain that as well as show you some of the various and different activities that we have been doing. So it's going to be a mixed sort of presentation. Um, to begin with I would like to show you two videos and I will briefly tell you what these two videos are. These two videos are about food are about eating in a restaurant. Um, they are about Italy. In many ways, uh, during this talk, I will refer to Italy. You can draw your own comparison between Italy and Greece, or Italy and some of the problems that we are experiencing in Cyprus, or for that matter, problems that we are also experiencing in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, Eating in a restaurant today, for a politician in Italy, has become dangerous. And it has become dangerous because people no longer have the basic services and the basic hopes that they had in the past. Um, and it has become dangerous because for the past 20 years, people sitting in a bar, have always voiced their distaste for politics. They have voiced their distaste for corruption. They have voiced what they would like to do to those corrupt politicians. But they never ever have voiced their anger in public. They have never voiced their anger over a meal. I want to show you the first video and then I will have to translate but the video will give you a very good idea of uh, what is actually happening. Yes, thank you. translation and they start this chant okay uh, basically wishing him to choke on the food that is eating uh, I don't know how many of you there is a know about this but in Italy there has been a tradition that has been going on for quite a while and um, particularly from people that are very very disgruntled and it is that of slicing, going to direct, they go to vote, you go with your, uh, take your pencil, and you have something in your pocket. And generally speaking, what they do is, uh, they write on the ballot paper, you have eaten everything else, eat this as well. And they put a slice of mortadella, a slice of salami, they wrap and they close the ballot paper and they put it in. It's something that has happened several times over 
over time. Food, the idea of corruption as eating society, eating away society, eating away the future of society, is becoming actually an extremely interesting point because it is juxtaposed to the fact that now other people do not have food. There is no longer food for everybody. Um, can we just go for a few more seconds? <laughs> His invitation falls on deaf ears. Um, and they reply to him, addressing him as a buffone. The buffone is uh, the court clown. Okay? There is absolutely no longer any possible dialogue between the political parties and a part of society that is becoming larger and larger. Uh, the reasons for this may be many. Um, we, we will touch upon some of them today. I just want to show the second video, please. It is not something that is far away. And I wonder, one of my questions, one of my simple questions is this. I had to leave the country if I wanted to do a career. And I can tell you exactly how much it cost me. Why other people in Italy hold a faculty position for themselves as a head of department. Then you have their wife. And then you have their son, their daughter, the other son, the wife of the first son, the boyfriend of the daughter, the girlfriend of the other son. There was a discussion in Italy in the 1970s, and it was about what would happen, what was happening in Italy. Would where was our moral compass? One writer, is Sicilian, his name is Leonardo Sciascia, in a complex analysis of Italy, he said something, and then more or less, I'm paraphrasing, he went along this way, that the south of Italy would southernize the north. And he meant to say that corruption is a virus, it is a contagion. It is a slippery slope. My question is why Italy and the Mediterranean countries 
have not been able to express a political class that is different. A political class, as we were discussing before, that when it is approached by some other people, somewhere else, in order to be corrupt, they reject the money and do the interest of their own country. I think we are in what is called a post-postmodern phase. We are in what is a post-post-capitalistic world. And we are in the condition of a post-post-state. Margaret Thatcher was partially right. There is no such a thing as a society was not true when she spoke. I believe that it is actually true today. The moment in which we are dismantling the reasons why we should be together, the moment in which there is no longer social upwards mobility, there is no longer meritocracy, there are no longer opportunities for everybody, we no longer a society. We no longer have common goals. We do not longer have, as in the painting of Diamantis, the necessity of sticking together, the necessity of planting for a possibility in the future. I would like to go back to the presentation. One of the things that I have thought in this way <coughs> in these days, and because of these thoughts, is very, very simple. When this crisis started, the first issues that were brought back, that were presented to us, it was, there is a crisis, arts and culture are useless, we need to cut them. And I thought, I said, well, it's going to be starting with this, and it's going to be affecting all different kinds of other social aspects. And I was surprised. We, you know, as art, you always, we have lived with this label of not being necessary. Culture is something that you don't eat, doesn't provide you anything. I actually disagree with that. Culture, art, is an idea. It's the possibility of a future, which in the painting of Diamantes, is that little spot of light in the canvas. Constructing a future is something extremely important. Finding new ways of relating ourselves to what the future will be is the duty of art and culture. And I can bring you all different sorts of examples of arts and artworks that have symbolized the regeneration of entire areas. The Angel of the North, Tate Modern in London, and we can go on and on and on. We can look at Raffaello, we can look at Leonardo, Caravaggio, what each one of them meant for their own period. Can we go to the next image? One of my thoughts was, and went back to the concept of intertete art, which means the generate art, which is signed at the moment in which, in Germany, before World War II, in which art, an art expressed by minority, was no longer viable, was no longer art. And so today I started to think that these cuts, today, I started to think when the cuts happened that they were a sign of things to come. They were a sign of all different aspects of our lives being affected. In the creation of a different system, a new system, in which, I believe, we would see different participants, 
people that deserved to be in the system and people that not, do not, did not deserve to be in the system. Things that were useful and things that were not useful. People that were useful and people that were not useful. If artists are not useful today, by comparison, tomorrow all different citizens can no longer be useful. There is no longer a justification to support them because they are no longer a viable economic option. And we can start by thinking about people that have handicaps, people that are homeless, why to support them? People, students, why should we support studies for the next generation? And I, I took this picture, and it's perhaps about out of context, and I started to think, who are the people that deserve to eat? Who are the people that according to the system that we have today, and that we are being uh, that we're being caged in, which categories will be the ones that will be afforded to it and the ones that will not be afforded to it. I'll give you an example that years ago a friend of mine was working in a ministry in Italy and something happened that was very interesting. Somebody went from a village, perhaps like the village in the, in the, in the painting of Diamantis, and he had a daughter. The daughter had a handicap. She was, she was affected by Down syndrome. His wife has died. He was in his late 50s. The daughter needed to have support from the state. Support that is supposed to be granted by all different sorts of laws and that has, and that Italy, for which Italy receives, EU funding. The guy went back home he was sick, probably a couple of years more to live, with no help at all. Because the funding were supposed to support the imminent campaign, political campaign, of several political parties equally divided. I think we have to start seriously as artists, as cultural operators, but just as a society in general, start rethinking about what future for us means. Um, I also think that I am somebody that feels very empowered. I think that we can make a difference, perhaps a small difference, and maybe just in our small behaviors. Nevertheless, there are differences that we can make. Uh, and we come here to the title of this presentation, which is uh, what is actually our role. And at times, you know, I, I like to work, I enjoy doing the work, I enjoy doing the things that I do. In this particular period, uh, it is difficult to say I enjoy. I feel that there is a duty for me to do the things that I do, because I still believe in some form of society. I'm not ready yet to give it up. Um, yes, please. So, this was the talk in Athens. I started a project a couple of years ago, which is called the Museum of Contemporary Cuts. What does the word cut mean? How can we create a museum? How can we create a record of all the different things that have been happening? Uh, is it important to create a record? Let's think about the fencing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but the fencing in the United, what is now the United Kingdom, of land that dispossessed farms that were moved into the slums of London. 
can talk about the famine in Ireland, we can talk about the wrong choices that the Italian monarchy did that led to the war and led Italy to one of the biggest periods of poverty and migration after World War II. Well, if we think about all of that, do you really have stories? The stories for the closest period to you are transmitted orally. They are in the family. But there isn't really a record of the stories of the people. You just have numbers, like a number that appeared recently on an Italian newspaper, 4.2 million people are unemployed or living below the level of poverty in Greece. Two million people went to Ireland, sorry, went to America from Ireland, for example, in order to escape famine. Is that a correct number? We're not totally sure. Could be less, could be more. How much do we have of the stories? In the history books, in our culture, in our, even in our art history, all of these events disappear. They become a footnote. And we do not realize their importance, their impact on the lives of those people. If we look at the Great Depression, again, all the records that we have are limited. So what I wanted to do, it was to create a form of record to create the possibility and the opportunity for people to participate and to develop a series of initiatives that go from talks like this one to projects that are more complicated. We are collecting, for example, images uh, from all different sorts of artists that are dealing with the crisis, but we're also doing something else. I asked from the British government the data, particularly from, from the British um, Council to be correct, from the Arts Council, sorry, to be correct, I asked the data that is related to the cuts that happened from 2007 to present. And under the Freedom of Information Act, we received all the information that we needed. Um, and it starts to create a picture um, if we look at the suicides that have happened because of the crisis in Italy, there isn't very much information going on. Besides the couple of days of news, sometimes if it is an event that is particularly um, dramatic, and then it disappears. And so we started to actually collect the names of all the people in order to create a memorial a form of memorialization, a form of narration that allows us to keep a record and also to keep a track of the dramatic events that are happening in this period. Um, I call museums. The museum was born during in 2012 as part of the art festival that is organized by FACT. It was done in Manchester. FACT is an organization that is in Liverpool. And the museum, one of the first things as a critique that it did, it was actually to create the merchandise shop. Because today, all art has to, interestingly enough, has to survive by itself. It is something that is not worthy of any sort of form of support. Um, these conversations are no longer worthy of support, according to, to many different people. And we go to the next one. And we go back to the goats. Um, why the goats? Well, if we think about the goats, the goats have represented in many, many different periods and many different parts of the Mediterranean, they have represented a part of the survival skills and the survival element uh, of society. And I think there is an ethical question to be asked to us. We are abandoning systems of cultural productions. We are abandoning systems of uh, society. We are abandoning ethical values. Pasolini, in the 1970s, 
asked if it was possible to swap progress and the American way of life and it's and now I would probably call love let's say because it's strong enough and it's love for technological progress with the values that Italy had inherited over the centuries. Um, that's okay. Um, that's a kind of what is I think that uh, the discussion that was, uh, that was there between the Pasolini and the then the Prime Minister was very interesting because there was a strong contrast. The Prime Minister at the time replied that he would have sacrificed all the fireflies in Italy. And the fireflies are this small insect that you see at the end of May, the beginning of June, in the fields of wheat. They're flying and emitting light. He would have sacrificed all of them for the washing machine that he finally could afford for his mother because his mother was washing clothes in a cold river, in Italian a cold lavatoio. It's a place where you go to actually wash all different kinds of clothes. I'm pretty sure that there may be some left here in Cyprus as well. Um, years later, many years later, after Pasolini was... Okay. After Pasolini was dead, what happened was that the Prime Minister wrote a form of apology saying that he finally understood what he meant. And he finally understood what it was that Italy had to give up. Um, I'm just going to be waiting a few seconds for uh, uh, this. Okay, so this is the first installation of the Museum of Contemporary Cats. So what is it exactly? Well, it is something strange. It's an artwork and it's a museum at the same time. I wanted to create a framework that would leave me free to do all different sort of things. Okay, and so the idea of an overarching artistic framework they used the museological and curatorial approaches seemed perfect because it left me the freedom of doing as much as I wanted but at the same time it gave me the rigor of search, it gave me the rigor of curatorial approach and it gave me the rigor of archiving and in fact the artwork itself, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the opening, the media are museolo museological and curatorial approaches, and then installation and various objects, etc., etc. Um, and the museum, what it does, it does a series of uh, interviews with artists. We collect material from artists, curators, and etc. In Britain, we are collecting the letters. You can send us, for example, the letters of funding cuts that people have received. So if you're a gallery, either you're closing or anyway, you receive a letter of funding cut, you can scan it, you can put it online and you can send it to us and we archive it. You can send me the actual letter itself if you wanted to. Um, you can relate to the process in different ways. And what we're doing is also photograph people that are currently are artists curator, cultural operators, etc., and asking them a very simple question, how much do you feel that the current cuts have affected you as a person? And they may tell you 50%, 50%, 100%, and depending on that percentage, a part of the image disappears. Um, this is the event that we're going to be doing in uh, um, Cyprus tomorrow. It's titled probably you have seen it flying around. It's titled upon the flesh. Well, my question is it's very simple. How much more do you want? How much more do you wish to take? 
Um, the discourse that we're doing today is uh, a discourse of constant sacrifices. And I feel that the sacrifices are happening only at the lowest level. Um, you have to sacrifice, for example, in Italy, you have to pay for your first house. It doesn't matter if you can afford it or you cannot afford it. In any case, you have to pay taxes upon it. Um, you have to pay for uh, your health independently, quite often, from um, your income. And if you cannot afford it, you are stuck with a public service that over the past 20 years has become increasingly inefficient. You are obliged, if you want any form of care, to go to visit your private doctor, I don't know how it works here, who's the same person that works within the hospital and is going to be doing the surgery to you, who nevertheless is paid both by you, because you have to pay for the private visit, and by the state that is paying its salary, its or her salary. And so what happens is we're paying many different times for the same service, because when you get your salary, you're paying for the health system and then you pay on top of that further when you have to get services from the hospital. You have to also pay the doctor in order to have a bed in the hospital, in order for you to be able to access the care that should be provided to you from the state. And that is why I think that there is a very serious there is a very serious problem because a society, a Mediterranean society, I said before that Shasha thought that the south of Italy would southernize the north. I said something very controversial once, which I will repeat, and I say that the Mediterranean countries have contributed corruption to the European Union, which means that Unfortunate as it is, we have not been able to move on certain kinds of form of management. And that is probably our fault. Society is based on fairness. Even stealing a pen, I think, for 50 cents should be punished severely. Because there is no longer a distinction between what is called the res publica and res privata. Res publica does not mean that it does not belong to anyone. It does not mean that everyone who can, can actually steal it. Res publica has a very clear, uh, identifiable owners, series of owners. And those owners are all of us. And it is not possible to let money be confused, to let the money of the state be used for any other purposes that are not the purposes of the state itself, which is the totality of its citizens, and not a part. Can we go to the next slide? So, this was something that I did in London. Uh, in London now you're obliged to, <coughs> if you have a council house, you have two rooms, you are one pensioner, you have to rent the other room. And you're obliged to rent the other room. So we decided to do a performance. We decided to go to the house, the official house of the Prime Minister in a travel that would analyze um, the problems that Britain currently face, and to look at the possibility of shutting up, living with the Prime Minister in his official mansion. And this is another project, we just did this one in uh, Athens. And this is a very beautiful story. Um, we posted, this is a poster, and we posted in the public road, but it stayed for quite long. When we left, it was still there, so it may still be there. And it's, I have this thought, Spartacus and Spartacus is 
about you know, change, revolution, let's alter everything, uh, let's do new things, and let's alter things drastically. I'm wondering if there is no such a thing as society, there are no citizens. That is obvious. And if there are, there are no citizens, my question, my cultural question is, who are we? Or even worse, what are we? Is the process of commodification gone that far that by the disappearance of citizenship, we have actually the appearance of a form of commodified slavery? A commodified slavery, at least in Rome, in ancient Rome, in slavery, the master had the onus, the legal onus, okay, of feeding the slave, of treating the slave in a certain kind of way. And of course, if it did not do that, and the case was brought to court, the master would be punished. Interestingly enough, in this system, I don't think that there is an onus on anybody on feeding the commodified citizen, or what it is probably the post postmodern slave. So the story here is very simple. It's about greed. I imagine, you know, imagine I asked, how does it look like a billion euros? Well, you know, I asked in the audience, has anybody seen it? Uh, for me, it's a mythical animal. It's like the unicorn, you know? The, pink, the invisible pink unicorn flying around. One billion euros, 10 billion euros, 20 billion euros. What does it look like? And more importantly, how much money do you need? And so the question here becomes really funny because I'm wondering, these people with all of this money, with their villas by the sea, okay, and then, you know, you have the dock, and by the dock, you don't have a yacht, you have a submarine, okay, all nicely painted, white, glossy design, signature, and etc. And this submarine is there to save you from the apocalypse. Because, you know, if you have all of this money, I'm pretty sure that you want to be ready for the apocalypse or any political change that may be not favorable to you in order to run. And you can imagine, you know, somebody running through the stairs and, you know, quickly with all the servants going onto the submarine. Now, if you have 100 billion euros or whatever other astronomical amount of money that you may have, you may feel slightly unsettled by the events. And so you have to run when you get onto the submarine and use the loo. And what kind of loo will you have in this submarine? And I thought, well, I would probably have a diamond encrusted toilet. Because, you know, you cannot use a solid gold toilet or a silver one. And God forbid you had a white ceramic toilet. And that's what the question is. What is the proportionality today between greed and the lives of all the others that have very little or nothing? Can we go to the next one? Back to the goat. I love this goat. You will see why when we're having all of these goats in. The goat in Greek is the capris, isn't it? It's a tragodia. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. I did my Greek, my classic Greek, when I was in school. I was tortured by this professor. I mean, you know, she was, uh, she was in the late 60s, and believe me, you, she made us study that Greek grammar. You know, he had absolutely no idea reading Euripides or, you know, Sophocles or. I still remember, I, I loved it, I preferred the, the Greek authors to the Latins. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, 
you know, it was it was hard. I mean, it was high school. I was 14. <laughs> I I would have preferred that doing all different sorts of other stuff at the time. And uh, I'm wondering who is responsible for all the things that are happening today. Is it us? as a citizen because of our cultural behaviors and because of what we have produced, or is it something that is outside us? Are we just, you know, the scapegoats for this situation? And is there a way, is there a possibility of reinterpreting and reanalyzing these structures in order to rethink how to, how to work within them? How it's not just to resist, that's actually how to fight, how to make a living in a different way, how not to participate within the system, and how not to be just scapegoats. Uh, this is the project that I was talking about before. Cats means a maiming of the body, your integrity disappears. If we look at the body of society, the body of society is being cut, is being torn apart. There is no such a thing that is presented to us in metaphorical forms, these beautiful metaphors, austerity cuts that are good for you. A cut is a cut. If you cut a finger, it hurts. If people are starving in the streets, it does not just hurt those people, but all the rest of society. I want to speed up. Oh, so can we just move on? This is another project. It's called National Panties. Uh, I have, I'm enjoying myself in this period, uh, you know. As, uh, National Panty, so this is in Manchester, again, it was part of the Anime Festival, it went kind of viral, we started with Italy, with all different sorts of questions about the economic cuts, what does it mean that the panties have been chosen with a particular view, it has to do with the struggles of the workers in the 1970s, and um, today it's no longer fashionable to talk about these issues, it hasn't been fashionable for a long period of time, now I think it's coming back into fashion. Can we go to the next? This is a Westminster. By, by the way, these are not photoshopped, okay? So just so for the record, we're going there, we're holding the panties up and we're taking pictures of them. But they will start appearing soon also you know, on different platforms, etc. This is the other one. Uh, this is the other project, and it is about people funding themselves. So I have basically hired the people that are unemployed using my own money, okay? I have used my own money to pay for people who are unemployed, okay? To sit there and fund themselves. Because we don't do anything. We are useless, and therefore we can live by doing useless activities. They sign a contract of enslavement, okay? Because of course, you know, I give you money, I need to enslave you. And I get back to the goat. Well, I hope you're having fun with this presentation. <laughs> now, the goat is an animal that you can milk. Okay, milk a goat. How much can you milk this poor goat? You have to feed it from time to time. And so, this is the new exhibition that we have prepared, because we're preparing all different sorts of things, and we're focusing on economics this year, strongly, perhaps for a good part of next year as well. And so it's a jurisdiction shopping, it's Palo Cirio. It's this guy that basically has created a system that allows you to own a fake company in the Cayman Islands and therefore to try not to pay your taxes any longer. Because the idea is if it is possible and legal to be legal and not participate within the state, well, let's make, let's make it democratic and not elitist. Why should just a few people not pay taxes? Apple, 
in these days. Let's not all pay taxes. Let's no longer contribute. Why do I have to contribute if then I also have to pay for private services? There is no such a thing as a society. There is no such a thing as a state. And this is the other exhibition that we're going to be doing at the Museum of Contemporary Arts, which is looking at the artworks that this artist has done and looking at an understanding, a possible attempt to understand of the flow of money through an artistic experience. We did this one that is called The Cost of Living and it's looking at the body of society as if it was a human body. And we were talking about cats. If the body, if a human body has a tumour, you cut it out. You take it away from the body. You eliminate it. You are supported. So what is contemporary knowledge? Is contemporary knowledge and the social crisis that we are experiencing a metastasis? Is it a cancer? How should we be dealing with it? What should we be doing? Should we be cutting this cancer out of the social body? And the exhibition was called, there were two running at the same time, it was called The Body of Evidence. One. And was looking at the evidence provided by the artist, who, by the way, was experiencing and is experiencing a malignant tumor, and looking at his interpretation of life and society in a crisis through his own body. Can we go through this? Um, while he was doing that, he was also publishing online with us the cost of the drugs that he was taking, raising the question, should he be saved? Should we save somebody that is dying of cancer? Is it a duty for us as a society? Is it economically viable? The goat. I find it to be an extremely fascinating animal at times because it's something that allows you to survive and it survives itself in the most difficult environments. And this is the exhibition, I'm just going to be showing you some of the images. We wanted to do something that was extremely minimal and that created the feeling and we did it only with the lights by choosing special lights, created the feeling of uh, a hospital in the gallery itself. And you can see those stands, they reflect some of the data that the body of the artist has been produced. So for example, reflected the graph of his white cells in his body, reflected all different kind of data in graphic visualization that were produced by the artist. And we used them in different, in different ways. Um, the hats in there represent his emotional status. Because when you're doing chemotherapy, you have to change your way of dressing. Sometimes you have to wear a hat. And so the hat reflected a mood, the mood that the artist had in a particular time. These ones were the whole medicines, or medicines that he was taking. Again, they followed the graph of his health. And this finally, this was the last room where we decided to have a series of folded bed sheets. It is almost like a case that is closed before it begins. It's almost like a feeling that in a way there is no hope, there is no way of reacting to this process that is imposed upon you. And we had that, this one, which is the body 
with the data and the error of transmission. This one is something else that we did. It's called The Market Will Save Us. It was uh, an art intervention in Freeze magazine and it followed uh, an exhibition that was called The Market uh, Will Save the World in Casa Gallery. And there was an installation in, uh, um, at the Royal College of Art on the facade of the Royal College of Art. Because what you also have to think is that education today has become extremely costly. And it's becoming a privilege of the few. No longer we talk about education as something that is a right, accessible to all. It becomes something, particularly when you have to pay something like £27,000 in fees, um, that some people can afford and others cannot. So meritocracy is no longer there. Uh, we could argue that meritocracy is based on the amount of money that your parents have been able to earn, which could be considered a criterion. And these are some of the images that he prepared and that we exhibited both within the gallery and uh, within uh, the uh, online space. Stop here. The artist, his name is Bill Balascas, and he was, he's from Greece and he's actually studying at the Royal College of Art. I showed you all these different goats for one reason. And I would like to close the talk with this analysis. In Sardinia, in Italy, there was a particular goat that is called the goat of the widows and the orphans. Okay. It's like a sacred animal. You are in a village, there are not very many resources. And the moment in which you're left stranded, your only resources are provided by this goat. It's the milk of the goat, the baby of the goat, that basically provides you with the possibility of not starving. To steal the goat of the widow and the orphans, it would mean death to you. It would be considered the most cowardly act ever to be made, because it meant to throw on the streets to oblige those people to die. It is the weakest in society that have to be protected. And even the most cruel societies, because farming is not an easy activity, beyond the romanticism that we are presented with, it is hard work. And we all know that, because we live in the Mediterranean that although provides us with some resources, it's a very harsh land. To eat that goat, that's why it's that skull there, is probably the most, I think it's the expression of a no longer existing civilized society. And my final question is this one. Can we consider ourselves civilized societies in the moment which we throw <clears throat> the weakest people that we have on the streets. I'll close it here. Thank you. <laughs>
professions in my art and in my life. I was uh, always uh, thinking what is my mission as a human being like, what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of death. Uh, but are the questions that I really think that are important for an artist uh, and for a human being. Uh, and in fact, uh, listening to your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, when we try to uh, reorient uh, the search of the artist away from institutions, from the systems of art and production of arts uh, to society. Uh, I would maybe uh, recall uh, another question. Uh, and the big crisis uh, is the crisis of modernity. Uh, and the great hit of culture since modernity, Schiller, Max Weber, uh, they have brought much about this issue. And is the devaluation of culture the dehumanization of culture uh, and of course the devaluation of art, the dehumanization of art. Uh, and really I agree that today we have to address as artists the real living uh, human problems, especially of the people that they are living, the vaccines, the vulnerable people, and the people that they are in. Uh, in really uh, very hard circumstances. Uh, Thank you for asking. The comparison is uh, uh, flattering, to say the least. Um, I, you know, all that you brought up is exactly what I have tried to uh, bring with this talk. Um, I think that we have a duty. I think that there is a duty. Uh, I, the only thing that I'm left with that I can think of is that today, as cultural producers, as artists, if you want to use that word, um, we have to try to refine a way. To find a way for ourselves and to find a way for others. And this is the only thing that I can think of. I'm not able to provide answers and to say we should be operating in this way, there is this response to be given, and there is that response to be given, or the other. I can certainly, you know, if I dismiss for one second the visual art and the artistic, artistic element in me, and I look at things in academic terms, I think that we have a challenge. And our challenge is in the behaviors. We have to change our behaviors. Um, that is our challenge. That's, for the Mediterranean country, that is the challenge that we're facing. And the way in which we will be able to get together, try to solve some of the problems. In Italy, for example, I'll give you an example. In Italy, they made a law for, an, for basically trying to raise employment which instead, what it did, it created unemployment or bad employment as a permanent solution, which is called precarity. You do not know if in six months' time you will still have the job or not. But you're talking about everyone. You said it's the thing. Can I ask you something? And this is my question. When I look at it, I, I can't remember now the data, how many millions of unemployed people are there. But if everybody, today you can put one euro, okay, in a common pot, is it possible if everybody contributes one euro per year, okay, with the system that we have in place, which is different media, people can work for free, people can do all different, we can ask for support from different lawyers, from different categories of people, can we all put together a little bit and challenge these systems? Can we do something in order to 
create a different form. Nobody in Italy during the past 15 years has actually collected money to challenge the law at European level, to bring it through the whole process. And I have to say this, this is one thing that I find um, particularly, it's a contrast that I find between some of the northern societies at times and some of the Mediterranean societies. Um, it's the difference that I find at times between being Italian and being a citizen of the world, an empowered citizen of the world. Uh, at times, there is this, in the, Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean, or at least in Italy, there is this sense of lack of power. You are powerless. The institutions make you feel powerless. I have never trusted the institutions. I went to Britain, <coughs> the system works. It's not perfect, but it works. You know that by doing certain kind of things, you can obtain a certain kind of things. In the United States of America, in some ways, I'm not saying that they're perfect social systems, but nevertheless, people challenge the system. People pull forces together. And I think perhaps what we should start reconsidering is behavioral system. And it's saying, can we actually act as empowered citizens? I'll tell you something. I had a run in Cyprus uh, last November. And I was told that I am a disenchanted uh, racist. No, no, I wasn't that. that. I'm a disenchanted, uh, um, how would you call it? Um, academic, pessimistic academic, and etc. Um, and it was about politics, it was about the, the contemporary politics, because in all honesty, I cannot believe in the working of this left, Italian left, for the others it is your judgment, but for the Italian left it has shown me clearly, clearly, that there is no possibility of working with them. And I was talking about this and I said, look, you know, with somebody else, I said, you don't understand. You do not understand that the level, how much people are disgruntled with all of this. And it, you know, you reach a certain kind of age, I'm 45, and to hear that you, know, you are disenchanted, I say, no, actually, I'm not disenchanted. It's just that sometimes, Human nature, people find it difficult to work together. Guys, it's difficult. We know. It's, I mean, you know, you come from villages, there are all different kind of things. And going on. I, you know, my mom came okay, in Italy, she belonged to a village. If there were 200 people, everybody knew everything about everybody else. You know, you couldn't do anything without somebody having a comment to make, and etc., etc. Nevertheless, despite all of that, despite all the feuds, all the quarreling, and etc., etc., kind of worked together. Is it a mythological, uh, you know, remembrance of the raps? Nevertheless, I said, okay, I don't like to hear this. Let me try to see if there is something that I can do. And so I came up with a project. And the pro we will see what will happen to this project because I really want to do it. Do you know the European Union sends funding, okay, sends money to Italy, sends Greece sends money everywhere. And this money is supposed to achieve a certain kind of goals. Build a research center, support the arts, help the handicap, to do this, to do that, to do the other. Who knows about the anti-fraud system of the European Union? Fraud. Fraud. In a, yes. Who knows anything about it? How does it work? Do you know how it works? Okay, let's, let's say something. Um, if you are a thief, what happens to you in Cyprus? Well, there is somebody that sees you, reports your act, the police automatically investigates. If you have stolen something, you are arrested. Okay? 
How do you think it works in the European Union? The thief has to go to the police to report the robbery. Okay? So it is the state, okay, which is made of corrupt politicians, that has to report to the European Union the corruption that is going on on the funding of the European Union. Which politician is going to be reporting the money that they're stealing? I would like to understand. And in Italy, sorry. sorry. How many people get paid to work in this department? I'm just wondering. Um, that's something else that we would have to look into. Uh, that's an, it's even more interesting as a question. So the response to, the, to all this project is we're going to be creating, my intention now is to create something that is called the DDT. I like that. It's like the old spray and etc. You know, all, everybody has mobile phones. The idea is you get, a, you, know, you get a website and it says there is this project of the European Union in Cyprus that has received this amount of money that we're supposed to create, you know, this tower of 500 floors. Is it there? Can you send us a picture? Uh, and then sending, trying to send the data to this bloody European Union in order to understand Okay? If they're actually able to do something, they're not going to be able to do anything, but at least is to show their inefficiency. Because I think that there is a very serious problem. I was a federalist, okay? and I, now it's five years, I have changed. I, you know, they say to me, would you like to leave the European Union tomorrow, the Euro tomorrow? Yes, would you like to leave the European Union even sooner than tomorrow if it's possible? Why? Because this is not a European Union of the citizens. It does not have anything to do with you, and it does not have anything to do with me, unfortunately. I'm going to ask you something very, very simple. Or I'm going to tell you something very, very simple. Probably it's easier. If I wanted to buy a house in London, okay, I have a property in Italy, and I want to get a mortgage on that property. The mortgages in Finland are, let's say, 3%. The mortgages in Italy are 20% interest. I would like to get a mortgage with a Finnish. I'm saving 70%. Okay? That would be great. I can get 70% and I can buy the house in London. Can you do that? The answer is no. So, in all the economic elements that should benefit us as citizens, the European Union is failing. And this is the biggest question that I have. Is it possible that within the European Parliament, for the past 20 years, nobody has understood who Berlusconi was? Is it possible that the European Union does not intervene if there is a prime minister in a major state that has a conflict of interest? More than that, how Germany or France has the moral right today to tell us that we are a bunch of lazy Mediterraneans when they have been doing business with these very corrupt politicians? This is my question. And more importantly, how, where is the moral standing to tell us today, for example, that we have to slash our budgets when they went over budget for the first time? They were the first ones to go over budget for the first time. And I'm going to be telling this to you today. They started to talk about altering the structure. It says, well, the recession is increasing, it's not going away. It's probably now going to be hit, hitting after Germany and uh, France. Let's try to change the policy. Austerity is not our priority any longer. Uh, I have a very serious problem. What the problem is, when I look at a paper of a student, I want and I like a coherent discourse, a discourse that makes sense. And unfortunately, I do not find that the discourses that are coming out of the media, that are coming out of society in general, 
are actually making any sense in the long term. And this is a huge problem. So. Somebody said that the crisis that we have in general in the world, it comes out from our not being able to express in language, in words, what is happening around us. And this is how we all get a little bit mixed up. But as well about this, um, you know, what's happening today, the economic, uh, uh, cultural, and everything, it's been planned for a long time ago. I mean, you read books, you know, the 18th century German philosophers, they had it all planned out. It's all written right there. So, you know, it makes you wonder because um, I think um, some of these people know that they get reborn when they die. You know what I mean? Because it started in the 1700s or 1800s. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that it was planned and etc. I seriously, you know, I'm, I doubt, I would have that to then uh, to subscribe to a theory of pessimism and that would go even, even further. I mean, what I think is that there is an absolute sometimes inability and incompetence. Uh, there is a short-sighted approach to society whereby personal interest overcomes. It's about the private interest, which is the res privata, becomes more important than the res publica. Um, that, I think, is more important because then what you would have to do is uh, to subscribe to the idea that there is uh, a hierarchical system that is not possible to change. And perhaps I'm deluded. Um, no, it's probably from all Rome or even Egypt, you know, all these systems that come to our days. I mean, this is how I understand the system at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, it sounds totally fantastic, you know, but uh, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense um, of how things are becoming to an end, because this is about slavery, it's about controlling the world. And it's not even about greed, it's about power. You know, the greed is between other other sections of society. The top top one is what really controlling the whole game, I think, is about power. It has nothing to do with greed. It's about, oh, we can do that, can we? I mean, who's going to know? You know, I mean, genetically modifying this and, and genetically modifying that. I mean, we have Huxley talking about it. We have Orwell talking about it, giving us the hints. It's happening, guys. It's coming, you know. Um, a lot of other, a lot of other writers wrote about uh, the island, this movie, which is a book as well, which is where we the writers. Um, we have a lot of signs, they tell us, these people tell us, they tell us, it's coming. Uh, who was the president of, in, of Greece, who was, or the prime minister of Greece, who was, um, took a notice? This was probably about 10 years ago, when he was, the woman who was giving him the notice was saying, I'm ready to be the president in times where people are going to be dying. People are going to be having, is the, uh, Europe is going to, they've been telling us all along, it's right there, you know? So they've been building at the same time, how I see it, the psychological, for us, the psychological kind of like ground to actually uh, implement, uh, you know, economic collapses, wars everywhere. I mean, now the war is like, I mean, world war, it's happening, you know, it's like, there's little pockets here and there, like, but it's everywhere. For every 10 writers who get it right, there are other 10 writers who get, get it wrong. Excuse me, I didn't understand. For every 10 writers who get it right, there are other 10 writers who get it wrong. So what we do is that hide hindsight. Yeah, but you have the signs now, I mean, this is the thing. Uh, <laughs> I can only, you know, if, I, if we think, if we try to think about it seriously, I can only say what we think about it, and it's, uh, there is a possibility, perhaps, I still believe that we can try in different ways to sort of make a difference. And I don't mean necessarily a huge difference, but um, there are examples of, you know, we are being, you have bills that arrive to you and you don't understand anything of that bill, what you're going to be charged for, what you're getting charged for, okay? Uh, in Italy, they created, somebody created a system to online where it reads your bill. And it started the suing, okay, it started uh, inviting people to reanalyze their bills, or electric bills, and trying to oblige the company to correct the bills. 
And that has been going on for a while, and at some point they tried to shut him down, and he had to go to court in order to defend himself, and etc., etc. Why? Because it is through obscurity that you can actually fool people. And you end up with all different sorts of parallel taxes imposed upon us by so-called private organizations that instead are operating as if they were a state. Because, can I ask you something, when Barclays agrees with the Deutsche Bank, okay, to fake the interest rate in order to get more money out from people every year, and here we're speaking of hundreds of pounds or hundreds of euros from mortgages, from people or loans and etc., well, that is like creating a parallel tax system. When the electric bill that arrives to you, it takes a 10 cents, 10 cents may not seem anything to you. Over 70 million people, it's a huge amount of money. Over 10 years, it's an incredible amount of money. Those 10 cents that are stolen for you for services not provided and etc. etc. is money that could go within the state. So what we need really to start asking at one point is we seriously have to relook at these companies, we seriously have to relook at the morality of this company at their ethical behaviors more than morality and to say okay you are a private company you are not a state and you have to operate within the laws because that is money that today we could be using for something else yeah yes, uh, quick question are we living really Um, yeah, well, you know, it's, in, it's through the use of public, I personally believe it's through the use of public space and online systems. This is exactly what I believe. I think that we have great opportunities today to reframe some of the discourses or to at least try to reframe some of the discourses. Um, well, will this create change? No. I don't, uh, I don't think so, I don't think so. Will it create power, the power of whose power? Um, again, it's about talking about a distributed system. Um, we're not talking about, you know, at one point I was at the University of Westminster, we were talking about all of this problem from uh, uh, Monsanto, genetically modified food, to, you know, the current political situation, uh, um, the crisis of the earth of the planet, earth in itself, which is not just global warming, but is, it's even more alarming, is the so-called rubbish that is constantly produced. Um, it's the process of consumption, the process of eating, in which we as a species are eating the planet. And we were saying, okay, probably we should stop being artists and we should become politicians, we should become captain of industries, we should start doing probably other things in a different, in a different manner and in a different way. Um, I sort of sat down and thought about that and uh, the only explanation or the thing that I found myself comfortable with it was the fact that I can talk to people. Uh, I like talking with people, I enjoy. Um, there are issues that I find are very close to my heart. And it's not because I have an interest, you know, it doesn't change my life nor career. Uh, but what they do is they allow me to talk with people and to present a different kind of discourse and to say, perhaps yes, there is the opportunity to make a small step together, perhaps, you know, there is the opportunity to make one or two people aware, and perhaps there is the opportunity to change the discourse because today, you know, the Germans look at us as if we are, you know, spending money and my mom and dad, they have never gone on to a holiday, never. They worked all their life in order to accumulate money. So it is not the Italians that are spending money. As much as it's not the Greeks, it's not. There is a system of corruptions in place. There are corrupt politicians. And these people that over a number of years 
have inflated the system because, because they have not created meritocracy. And we also have to ask something to ourselves. In Italy, it's extremely common to go to the politician, to go to the priest and ask to hire your son. And it doesn't matter if he deserves it or not, if he's better than everybody else. Why? Because that is the Mediterranean. It is a way that we have built over the centuries or over the millennia where personal relationships counted more than uh, at times meritocracy. It is our human understanding of the other. Some people may do it because they are moved by the human case. Some other people may do it because they have an interest. In Italy, for example, if you want to get hired, you give the first two years of your salary to the person that hired, made you, gave you the opportunity of being hired. These are systems that are no longer competitive in a global system. Unfortunately, culturally, politically, socially, economically, all of these chickens have come back to roost in the Mediterranean. And we have to decide, we have to have a very serious decision. We have to make very, very serious decisions on the way in which we operate. I hope it answers it. In fact, yeah. <laughs>